You know what I was thinking about the other day? Okay, yes, it was Starlink, but also how successful it's been and some of the reasons why. So recently Elon Musk spoke at the Mobile World Congress and one of the questions that he was asked is why he thinks Starlink is successful so far compared to the many other LEO constellations that historically have failed even before fully launching. Every other low Earth orbit communications constellation um, ever done has gone bankrupt. Uh, now, some of them have emerged from bankruptcy. The, let's just say the original owners uh, did not benefit from, from those constellations. So I wanted to break down this question and also bring in a special guest to talk about this with me and kind of go into some of the reasons that Elon gave for why Starlink is successful so far. Of course, they're still in that negative cash flow chasm and will be for a while, but compared to so many other LEOs historically that have failed, they're doing pretty well. And he has some really specific reasons he gave for why he thinks that is. From a technology standpoint, uh, Starlink is uh, quite different from prior LEO constellations in that the technology that we're deploying is, is very advanced. As many of you probably know, most low Earth orbit satellite constellations have gone bankrupt before even fully deploying their constellation. In fact, one of Elon's main goals with Starlink was... Our goal is not to go bankrupt. Yeah, to not go bankrupt. And so far, he is still in that negative cash flow chasm, but Starlink is looking like it's a lot more successful than many of the attempts in the past. So I got to thinking it might be cool to do a video explaining some of the reasons Elon gave during his recent talk at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona and also pick the brain of a special guest, as many of you guys know him and fly safe with him, Scott Manley. So we are going to break down why Starlink is successful compared to the many failures in the past. Historically, they were talking about ones then that failed, right? Iridium is the classic example of a, a network. They were going to provide phone service and they spent billions putting that together. They had to get launches from, uh, they, they get launches from uh, China even and uh, the US, various countries around the world because they were trying to get the best price for their launches. I think they launched about 60 and they, they had to launch them five or six at a time. The company's business model to compete directly with cellular didn't work. Nine months after its initial service launch, Iridium gave up and stopped service. Sure, SpaceX is probably spending uh, billions on their whole network, but they're launching many, many times more satellites. SpaceX has been extraordinarily aware of what caused these kind of failures in the past. They're obviously able to circumvent or compensate for some of those things because they own the launch service. They know exactly how much it's going to cost to launch these things. They were able to do the math up front. Now, Elon mentioned companies like Iridium and Orbcom did subsequently emerge from bankruptcy, but this was not because of the original LEO constellation from the original owner. Now, Elon pointed out that what often happens with space-based technology, and he even said it was pretty ironic, is that most of this that's being launched into space is pretty old, and that's because they spend so much time testing it on the ground to make sure that it will work in space. So technology that has generally been launched into orbit has been older technology, but of course, SpaceX is going down a different path. And we took the opposite approach and said, we're, we're going to make technology that is, uh, in some ways at least, uh, more advanced than what is on the ground. And we're just going to take a chance. Elon also made the claim that SpaceX boasts the most sophisticated phased array technology, with both the satellites having that phased array antenna and also the user terminal. You can't tell. Uh, as, as the system is switching over from one satellite to another. Um, there's no um, change in latency or jitter from one satellite to another. And this all happens on a microsecond level. 
Elon also says that a single satellite can illuminate many different user cell spots on the ground. He mentioned that they have the most sophisticated phased array technology. He also mentioned that it is a digital phased array system so that SpaceX can continue to make it more efficient by reprogramming it as needed. In the old days, you would have like a radar dish, right? Which would focus the radar beams onto a single point. And that would be like your, your best receiver. Well, it turns out you can actually model that as a lot of very small antennas with slightly different arrays and gains. And so that's called a phased array because you're actually a com uh, you're accounting for the phase difference as the signal arrives at this flat plate. And like at one side, it's slightly nearer the source than on the other side if it comes at an angle. And that means there's a phase because you've got your waves, right? The phase is where you're arriving inside that way. Anyway, by knowing that, you can construct an antenna that can look at all the different areas all at once. And yeah, what the actual antenna is something that's existed since the 60s or 70s. But now computer technology means that you can have these phase array antennas that are shockingly cheap and can listen in every direction and you can decode all the signals. And literally technology has moved on. Moore's law has given them a huge advantage here. And you know, one web are taking advantage of that as well. So you know, let's be clear, everybody can take advantage of these, but SpaceX are the ones that can take advantage of the fact that they own the launch vehicle. Elon says that they have a launch system with a high launch rate and capable of putting a lot of mass to orbit. Also because the Falcon 9 rocket has a reusable booster and a reusable fairing, the cost of launching mass to orbit is the lowest it's ever been. That has never existed before. Last year, SpaceX uh, delivered about two thirds of all uh, payload to orbit. And uh, this year we may uh, deliver closer to 80% of all payload to orbit of Earth. They are also reusing the launch vehicles. So they're also cheaper from that front. So SpaceX are in a better position than anyone else to make this successful, but they're not alone. And we've got one web after basically going bankrupt has been bailed out because other countries have an interest in having their own network. Amazon has plenty deep pockets, so they're going to support Project Kuiper. China wants to do their version. So commercially, SpaceX is well placed, but there's economic advantages to controlling your own network. He also pointed out that their satellites use Krypton ion thrusters instead of xenon. Now the, the satellites, for example, use a SpaceX developed uh, Krypton hold effect thruster, um, or which basically shoots out high speed ions of Krypton. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Superman, watch out for our satellites, don't go close to them. <laughs> so, like Krypton. Um, so, first of all, we're putting hundreds of satellites into space and they need thrusters to maintain orbit. One of the things Starlink's done is they're going to use high efficiency electric propulsion. And normally for electric propulsion, you use xenon gas because you're using electric propulsion on space missions that are, have to get the maximum amount of thrust. And xenon gives you the most thrust, but it's also about 50 times more expensive than krypton. So by using krypton, they need to spend a lot more power for their orbital maintenance thrusters, but their satellites are a hell of a lot cheaper. I mean, I think I was looking it up. It costs something like uh, $20, $30 per gram for Xenon. And you're talking like 30 cents per gram for a Krypton. So it's a huge difference in the cost. But I mean, that is just like a cost cutting thing. Basically, if you look at the way they've built these, every single decision they've made in the design has been about cutting the cost to build and to launch. And another example of how they've designed this is how they make them these flat pack designs that they can just stack, you know, 60 of them in a single rocket. There's no fancy separation systems or uh, single use stuff to distribute them. They have these four rods that kind of hold them on top of the rocket in place. And then when they get to the deployment point, instead of releasing them one at a time, like say, if you watch OneWeb, there do the release. They have all the satellites attached around the center and they, they pop off in pairs one at a time. 
SpaceX are just like, you know what? We, we know that this, it would cost money to do that. So instead they take the, the upper stage booster and they start spinning it around on its end. And then they just let them all go and they sort of fan out like a bunch of cards on a deck. You could imagine like just taking a deck of cards and stringing them across the room and they would split out. From there, they sort of then self-organize them and navigate them towards their final target orbits, which takes months. The fact is SpaceX is able to launch 60 of these on a booster. It's their own booster. Do you think that Starlink will succeed long-term? I mean, I know that they're still in that negative cash flow, but do you... I mean, I think of all the services, they're the ones best positioned to make it work. And the question is, is there enough of a demand? And if if it turns out that Starlink can't make it work, can't get enough buyers, then what you'll see is everybody else will probably back off their plans because it'll show that there's not a market there. Starlink can't do it profitably, then... Yeah, I mean, China's probably going to continue anyway because they like to control their own assets, but... Um, one web that's a harder sell for them uh, the big unknown is how many subscribers are going to get in the end and whether they can efficiently do it so when you consider all of these factors it's not that surprising that so far starlink is looking very successful also when you consider the fact that over half a million people have already signed up so many people are looking to use this service so I think it's going to be successful well into the future. Of course, I like to hear from you guys. Do you guys think that Starlink will continue to be a success or do you think that it has an inevitable demise? I'm really curious to hear from you guys, so please make sure to comment below. Step number one for Starlink is don't go bankrupt. That is, uh, <laughs> and, you know, then we can, if we succeed in not going bankrupt, then that'll be great and we can move on from there. Of course, if you are new to the channel, I am your Starlink girl. So if you're interested in Starlink and any Starlink related news, be sure to hit subscribe. You don't want to miss anything. Also, of course, if you're returning to the channel, thank you so much for your support and your loyal viewership. It means a lot to me. I love bringing you guys these videos and I have many more that I'm working on. So I hope to see you soon. I need a better catchphrase. And if you're really a fan of Starlink and Dishy McFlatface, why not get a shirt that represents that? I will have a link in the description if you want to get your own Dishy McFlatface shirt. Again, all of the support from my channel really means so much from you guys. I can make more content, keep you guys in the loop of what's going on in the world of Starlink. So your support really matters and I want to thank you. I'll see you soon.